Hello, and welcome to our podcast called Revitalization Under Colonization. Our names are Madison, Akira, and Nicole. We will be examining how Indigenous languages were lost through the residential school system and the current and best language revitalization efforts in Aotearoa and Canada. Our podcast will identify which country is more effectively addressing the urgent need to revitalize Indigenous languages and lessons that can be learned from each country's initiatives. Before we dive into the content of our podcast, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are filming at SFE Burnaby on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. This is where we come to learn, relearn, and unlearn and to become allies for Indigenous peoples and to become better educated on settler states' relationships with Indigenous peoples to understand how to move forward and mend relationships. Now we would like to introduce ourselves. My name is Madison. I'm a settler of Swedish and Swiss descent. I have two education minors and I'm completing an Indigenous studies major with the goal of becoming an elementary school teacher. I live on the unceded traditional territories of the Keitsi, Kwatlin, and Semiamu First Nations. I come to this study of Indigenous language revitalization with a keen interest in issues of social justice, equity, and diversity, and a genuine desire to seek ways to improve the lives of Indigenous peoples by restoring their languages. Tanse Akira Ayatel Nitsika Sun. Amiskwichi Waskahagen Ochinia. Hello, my name is Akira Ayatel. I am from Edmonton, Alberta, located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place of the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Metis, and Nakota Sioux. I am Plains Cree on my mother's side and Swampy Cree on my father's side from Ottawa Piscat, First Nation, located in Treaty 9 territory. I will be speaking about the history of Indian residential schools in Canada and native schools in Aotearoa and the effects on each country's indigenous languages. Being the granddaughter of an orphan and 60 scoop survivor, I did not grow up learning my language of Nehewak, also known as Cree, because it was lost due to attempted assimilation. I am on my reconnection journey and learning the language the best I can as an urbanized Indigenous person. My name is Nicole. I am a white unwelcome guest and settler on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. I work, play, learn, and live on the ancestral unceded lands of the Kukutlam First Nations. I come from Polish descent, studying environmental science and applied biology at SFU. I look to amplify Indigenous knowledge and science and hope to see more Indigenous language in research. I will be overviewing the history of Canadian Indian residential schools and the native schools of Aotearoa, more formally known by its colonized name of New Zealand, and how these institutions impacted Indigenous languages. The Canadian Indian residential schools ran for over a hundred years from the mid 1880s to the mid 1990s. Over 150,000 First Nations peoples attended Indian residential schools. The goals of these institutions were to assimilate them into European culture and eradicate indigenous ways of being, including their language, cultural beliefs and traditions. The goal was not to give these children proper or even adequate education. It was created by various government policies based on ideas that Europeans were inherently superior to indigenous peoples that they believed to be savage and uncivilized. It was one of their many mechanisms to achieve their goal of eliminating the Indian problem. Duncan Campbell Scott, the Deputy Superintendent of Indian Affairs, said, The policy should continue until there is not a single Indian in Canada that had not been absorbed into the body politic, and there is no Indian question and no Indian department. The former Prime Minister of Canada, 
John A. MacDonald said in 1883, when the school is on the reserve, the child lives with its parents, who are savages. He is surrounded by savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. It has been strongly pressed on myself as the head of the Department of Indian Affairs that Indian children should be withdrawn as much as possible from the parental influence. And the only way to do that would be to put them in central training industrial schools where they will acquire the habits and modes of thoughts of white men. From 1879 to 1986, the Canadian government actively created and pushed policies that wanted to systematically eradicate indigenous languages, cultures, religions, identity, and communities. In the late 19th century, the reserve system was created after the Canadian government wanted more land for industrial expansion and settlements. First Nations peoples were put onto small areas of land and Indian agents were introduced to control their land and mobility. First, there were mission schools until the Indian residential schools were implemented in 1879. They were used to push capitalist ideals of productivity and consumerism while also using education for religious conversion. In the beginning, enrollment into residential schools was optional, so the recruitment was very low. In 1885, the federal government's annual report had a declaration that Indigenous children in Indian residential schools should no longer be allowed to speak their Indigenous languages. In 1896, the federal government wrote all effort must be made to make the indigenous children speak English and to teach them to understand it or the entire work of the teacher will be wasted. The Indian Act was amended in 1919 and 1920 to make attendance mandatory or else parents and guardians would be fined or imprisoned. All First Nations children between the ages of 7 and 17 years old had to attend. By the end of the 1930s, almost 75% of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children between 7 and 15 years old attended residential schools, where they were kept almost year-round with little to no contact with their family and communities. In the beginning, there were Indigenous communities who were hopeful about the schools because they might have thought it would give their children opportunity and lead to settler employment, but they did not realize that European settler education would attempt to eradicate indigeneity with capitalist, religious, and racialized ideologies. Indigenous languages were identified by the government as one of the keys to disrupting and extinguishing their connection to their Indigenous identity. Therefore, many children were denied the right to speak and learn their own language. Children lost their Indigenous names and were given European names, removing their Indigenous identity to force them into European life. Students were abused physically and mentally for speaking their language. Children within the schools felt shame and fear to speak their language. When they would speak, they did it in secret to not face the abuse. At the Fort Alexander Indian Residential School, the nuns would physically abuse the children with straps and emotionally abuse them through public shaming and humiliation not only for speaking their language, but also when boys and girls would communicate or for speaking to their siblings. In the 1890s, Mary Augusta Tapage said if they were heard speaking shoe swap, they would have to write, I will not speak Indian anymore, a hundred times on the board. Children were put into small, dark closets for hours as punishment. Within Indigenous cultures, Storytelling is such an important component as it is one of the main ways children learn from their family and community. 
because it connects them to their history and traditions. Survivors have stated that English teachings were confusing, inappropriate, and too literal. Marcel Crochane from the Sang King Nation said Indian residential school teachings were inconsistent with Anishinaabe teachings because with Anishinaabe storytelling, it made you think and often had many meanings. But English teaching methods were very direct and directive. In residential school, Janie Margaret Matthews was told, you are here to learn English in or around the school. You will not speak Cree and anyone caught speaking it will be severely punished. You are here to be educated. You have been taken out of your homes because it is very difficult to learn under such unfortunate circumstances. It is not your fault and your families don't know any better so they must be forgiven for their old ways. However, you must forget your old ways. One Anishinaabe survivor states, coming back into my community, I felt as if I didn't belong. Even my grandmother said of my brother and I when we went to stay with her, she told her friends, you know these children who come out of that school, they're not right in the head. Those were words from my own grandmother. We no longer spoke the language. We no longer had that connection with family because we separated for so long. We didn't belong in the white world and we didn't belong in our community. Dan, an intergenerational survivor, says about his mother's memories before residential school that she remembers growing up before being taken to residential school, how strong the community was together she told me how everybody had a role and that the language was strong, the love in the community and amongst the people was strong. Indigenous elders say that language is the greatest loss of connection to their culture because language connects knowledge with culture and stories of past generations. Theodore Fontaine, a survivor of the Fort Alexander Indian Residential School, states that language is the main means by which culture, identity, and spirituality are articulated, shared, and passed on to the next generations. When you lose your Indigenous language, you lose a sense of who you are because, as Gomashi states, it is the foundation of the healing of your people. It is in your DNA, it is what defines you as it is deeply rooted in culture, ceremony, and ways of life. The long-term effects of the attempts of language eradication from residential schools can be seen today. From an interview of survivors of the Mount Elgin residential schools, only eight people could still speak their in indigenous language. Children of survivors speak about how their first language is English and even though their parents spoke their indigenous language, they never taught their children, most likely to protect them. Adult survivors are also more likely to suffer from mental and physical health problems compared to indigenous people who did not attend. The effects are also intergenerational as many children of survivors are at a greater risk for poor well-being and health. Alice Blondin Perrin said, our native languages were not to be heard or spoken. Our customs and traditions were denied to all of us. Our native spirituality denied. Our heritage was denied and not mentioned because their goal was to take the Indian out of us. We were not taught anything about the land, water, or Dene spirituality. We were only taught the white man's way and a very narrow version of even that. The government and missionaries wanted to civilize us and assimilate us, turn us into white people, make us learn their languages and customs. I am very sad that I lost my native tongue in residential school. All my life, I felt like I was looking into the windows of native people's homes because I was not able to participate in any discussions or laugh at their jokes. It was like a slap in the face. The reality of only speaking English set in when I could not communicate among my people. 
In 1840, the signing of the Te Tiriti o Waitangi occurred between the Maori and the Pakeha, which is a Maori term for New Zealanders of European ancestry. Two copies were produced, one in the Maori language and one in the English language. Between the two copies, there are clear mistranslations. The one that was used was the English one. In the beginning, native schools were half funded by the Maori and half by the government. Native schools operated for a hundred years in Aotearoa to increase assimilation. In Moon's article, he states mission schools began in 1816. The purpose was to teach the Maori to read the Bible in Te Reo Maori, their indigenous language. There were Maori who hosted and established mission schools. These schools were taught exclusively in their indigenous language, but by the 1880s, the government wanted to restrict the use of the language due to their belief of it being an impediment to assimilation. Soon after, the native schools code was created by James Pope. Who was the first inspector of New Zealand's native schools? The education of Maori children for the first thirty years of settlement was to convert the children to Christianity. They believed teaching them in their indigenous language would interest them more in the Bible and Christianity. In the 1844 Native Exemption Ordinance Act. It states that English must be the primary language of instruction to quicken the assimilation of Maori, but it did not take effect for three years. By the 1850s, more and more Maori parents wanted schools to be taught in English for opportunity in settler society. In 1867, the Native Schools Act passed. And schools were under government control instead of church control to increase assimilation. If the schools didn't teach in English, they wouldn't receive grants. In 1894, the School Attendance Act made it mandatory for Maori to attend native schools. By 1955, there were 166 native schools. Children were punished for speaking. Te Reo Maori instead of English. Methodist missionary Robert Ward said that combining school and living with Europeans was the most effective means of assimilating. Many settlers stated that the removal of the language would advance Maori society because it is deficient and an obstacle. The native schools were essential to form a national language. And to define the norms and values of the new social order for Maori, Europeanization was the ultimate goal of the native schools, and it was measured by the use of the English language. The generation a part of the native schools are known as Nya Morhu, the survivors, the stolen generation. In Canada, there are more than seventy indigenous languages spoken. However, seventy-five percent of indigenous languages are endangered, since most of them have less than a thousand speakers. When looking at data from the Yellowhead Institute, which keeps track of the completed TRC calls to action, call to action number fourteen that pertains to the government funding for indigenous language revitalization initiatives. Has still been neglected. Preventing further loss of indigenous languages is a pressing concern because language is the vehicle for transmitting indigenous knowledge, culture, spirituality, and identity. My review of primarily indigenous-authored research about indigenous language revitalization efforts in the Canadian context identified language immersion programs for adults and children. And digital technology as the most expedient and effective strategies. Since the vast majority of Indigenous children in Canada speak English or French as their first language, 
Indigenous language immersion is a necessary means to ensure the survival of Indigenous languages and culture. Early immersion during childhood is key to language learning and lifelong fluency. In her seminal research of two language nest programs in BC, the Lilawat Nation and Chief Adam Immersion School, BC's first Indigenous language school founded in 1991 in Adams Lake, Swampy Cree scholar Anoa McIver found that these total immersion programs at the preschool level contributed to an emerging fluency among the participants and fostered cultural pride and knowledge. Although highly successful, McIver concluded that as a standalone program, these nests cannot produce lifelong fluent speakers and must be part of a larger long-term community effort beyond the classroom. Fortunately, in the years following her research, the Chief Adam Language Nest became a catalyst for expanding the immersion program from kindergarten through grade four. Two studies by McCorum and Roy in 2017 and 2019 also support language immersion as an effective revitalization strategy. Their qualitative study of the Anishinaabeg MMAK Early Immersion Program was aimed at determining the program's academic success and language acquisition outcomes. Holistic teaching practices focused on experiential learning and inquiry were used to facilitate language learning. Their 2017 article examines the academic development of their students after two years at the MMAK program and found that participants surpassed academic expectations and showed strong cognitive skill development. These important results helped to dispel common parent concerns that language immersion would hinder their child's academic success or English language acquisition. McCorum and Roy's 2019 follow-up article focuses on Anishinaabe Moan language acquisition of MMAK participants. A combination of formal tests and natural observation showed increased fluency and accuracy as well as positive impacts on students' cultural awareness, confidence, and pride. This research helps to inform the development of similar Indigenous early immersion programs and encourages further inquiry into the positive outcomes around identity and self-esteem that culturally relevant Indigenous language learning provides. The Ganengea and Mohawk language immersion programs in Quebec for children and adults that opened in 1979 are the longest standing programs in Canada. Gomache presents case studies of the Ganungahe immersion programs with the goal of starting lessons to benefit similar Indigenous language revitalization efforts. From nursery school to grade four, children in the program are taught entirely in Ganungahe in grades five, and 60% of their instruction is in Mohawk and 40% in English. Gamashi found that the immersion program has been successful in creating new speakers and in cultivating a strong sense of community. She discovered that more children would attend the immersion program if trained teachers were available. The success of the adult immersion program hinged on the involvement of supportive elders and a communicative approach. This nine-month daily program focused on learning the language through conversations with different elders during various activities and outings and was successful in its aim to create more speakers of the language. An article by Jenny et al. in 2017 also shows the great potential that adult learners hold in language revital through mentor-apprentice programs, also known as MAP where Indigenous adult learners are paired with a fluent speaker and participate in daily oral immersion activities. Some of these activities include traveling on the land, berry picking, cooking, home chores, shopping, and more traditional activities. This two-year qualitative study of Natalna's MAP project 
highlights how practicing language not only fosters oral fluency, but also resilience and wellness by creating a sense of belonging and community for adult learners. This research also provides evidence that language revitalization offers important benefits to health and well-being. Digital technology has emerged as another key language revitalization strategy due to its wide and instant accessibility and ability to transcend geographic barriers. Gala maintains that digital technology is essential to the survival of Indigenous languages in the 21st century. Her analysis of survey data from 80 participants representing 47 Indigenous languages showed that technology serves multiple functions such as preservation, documentation, archiving, and sharing of language materials. The communication realm is expanded through interactive audio-video conferencing tools such as Zoom that allows for synchronous communication as learners have the opportunity to hear a wider population of fluent speakers from other regions. With a click of a mouse, Indigenous peoples are able to engage with a plethora of digital tools to supplement their language learning. Survey results also overwhelmingly indicated the power of technology to attract the younger generation to Indigenous language learning, since new technologies tend to make learning engaging and fun. Indigenous survey participants communicated that technology provides another medium to interact with the language, empowers them as language learners, and gives the language community ownership. A final document I want to conclude with is the First Peoples Cultural Council's report on the status of BC First Nations languages published in 2022. This report provides current province specific data on language use and programs and represents the voices of 167 First Nations communities. Although this report does address the critical role of immersion programs, it also celebrates the significant increase in initiatives since 2018 and how other language learning opportunities such as the Aboriginal Head Start programs, First Nations language courses in public schools, adult immersion programs, post-secondary courses, and parents raising their children in their mother tongue all contribute to Indigenous language revitalization one learner at a time. FPCC also partnered with First Nations communities to develop the digital research project, First Voices, that offers extensive web-based tools, keyboards, dictionary language apps, and services to support Indigenous language learning and archiving. The impressive Indigenous-led technology resource connects youth and elders through interactive online games and creative learning activities. The First Voices Language Archive showcases thousands of entries in diverse Indigenous writing systems in user-friendly ways through sounds, pictures, and videos. The Maori language has been lost and regained through time, following the foundation of Native schools in Aotearoa. Through colonization by the British, Te Reo Māori, also known as Te Reo, was nearly lost with less than 5% of children speaking Te Reo Māori in 1975, discussed by Ross Kalman in 2012. In 2021, the New Zealand consensus listed that 23% of Māori spoke Te Reo, being the only indigenous language in Aotearoa. Te Reo has been revitalized into three dialects of Te Reo based on region, with fundamentally similar ways of language. Although 23% is not ideal, the number is growing year by year. Bishop and Glynn in 1999 discussed the importance of language revitalization to the Maori, showing great lengths in the 1980s to revitalize the language. The Maori took lead in this process, placing their beliefs and values forward. At the forefront of te reo revitalization is kaupapa, described as a way of doing, such as a plan, as explained by Leslie Ramika in 2021. Fahama and their team in 2004 state kaupapa as, quote, not only a resistance strategy, but a strategy for nurturing and revitalizing te reo Māori and traditions, unquote. 
paraphrased by Leslie Ramika in 2021. It is clear that the revitalization of Te Reo to the Maori is much more than regaining language. It is about regaining identity. Much power is held in their language, discussed to be, quote, a living vitality and a spirit, unquote, by Leslie Ramika in 2021. In the late 1980s and going into the 1990s, the Maori expressed that education under the English government wasn't effective at teaching their children Te Reo. So the Maori began a movement of Te Reo Maori revitalization. In 1982, the Maori established, quote, Maori language nests, unquote, understood as Te Kohanga Reo, where Te Reo Maori and the Maori culture could be practiced and nurtured to its fullest potential, as discussed by Constantine in 2005 and Pahama in 2004. By 1993, there would be 809 Kohanga Reo in Aotearoa, with 330 Maori medium schools as of 2022. Maori medium schools, named Kura Kaupapa Maori, are schools in which the curriculum is taught in Te Reo, including primary, then secondary, then tertiary schools for adolescent children, keeping them within the Maori curriculum. The New Zealand Ministry of Education has expressed the difference in Maori education performance across the whole system, i.e. English medium schools included, stating a 10% point difference in Maori and non-Maori children, non-Maori children finding more success. Differently, children in Maori medium schools do not show these shortcomings. Rather, Maori education performance plays out much better by 15 to 20 percentage points. Unfortunately, children that progress from primary to secondary Maori medium school education is slim, with less than half of primary children progressing on. This data comes with assumptions about the Maori medium school system not providing enough opportunities for children in secondary school, but we'll get into this a little bit later. Of course, we see that Maori education and the revitalization of Te Reo plays a great part in identity. The New Zealand Ministry of Education funded a project led by Dr. Richard Hill, Dr. Leslie Ramika, and Dr. Mare Skerret. The title of this project is Transition Pathways of Tamariki Between Maori Medium Early Childhood Education and Schooling, Tamariki referring to children. Leslie Ramika in 2022 explains that the goal of the study was to observe how Maori children connected with their identity, language, and culture, along with their ability to reach their own goals academically and professionally. Parents of the children focused on in the study are included, gaining their insights into their child's education. Using Kaupapa Maori principles in interview formats, these professors included two families from each school including six early childhood education schools, six primary and six secondary levels from four regions. The main question posed in the study are, what are the reasons behind parents and whanau choosing Maori medium or English medium education for their child? Whanau referring to extended family. What they found regarding choosing Maori medium schools lied into four categories, including one, sense of identity and belonging, two, education quality and diversity, three, wananga tanga, or relationships, four, retention and revitalization of te reo Maori, following with parents' accounts on lost experiences in not learning te reo Maori. Parents found that their children gained a strong sense of understanding of what it means to be Maori and gained a strong sense of self-identity. The ability to learn in Maori medium schools while also living in an English-dominant country, allowed children to have a greater education. Leslie Ramika states, quote, Maori medium was also viewed as the best means of enabling Tamariki to walk in two worlds and succeed in both, end quote. Part of what applies to this is the wanatanga, or relationships, that Tamariki had with their classmates and teachers. The best factor as to why parents chose to enroll their tamariki in Maori medium schools was the retention and revitalization of Te Reo Maori. Since the 1980s, a huge part of repatriation for the Maori has been the revitalization of Te Reo through schooling, and parents found Maori medium schools to be a particularly accessible and fulfilling way for their tamariki to learn Te Reo. Parents discussed their own feeling about missing out on Te Reo Māori, expressing, quote, because I was brought up without the Reo, 
I felt that my kids were missing out on something I couldn't give them, end quote. As an initiative set out in the 1980s to immerse Maori children in Maori education as parents chose to, it has become quite successful in allowing Maori children to get in touch with their Maori culture through language revitalization. There do continue to be barriers when children become older, with fear that te reo may not open many doors for opportunities. Due to small classroom sizes, not all subjects are taught in Maori medium schools and in te reo, expressing much need for funding and support to ensure students in Maori medium schools gain a thorough, diverse education and allow them to pursue their passions in te reo. Overall, we see success in full Maori immersion schools, starting with early childhood education all the way through university. To conclude, to practice language reclamation and revitalization is to actively decolonize against the present reality of the colonial society. When you lose the connection to your indigenous language, it feels like you lose where you fit within your world, community, and culture. The Indian residential school system and the native school system removed indigenous languages, culture, connection to land, spirituality, ceremony, and familial ties. In Canada, language revitalization is a pressing concern because 75% of Indigenous languages are endangered, since most of them have less than a thousand speakers. When looking at research by primarily Indigenous authored scholars, it is evident that the most expedient and effective strategies for language revitalization are language immersion programs for adults and children and the use of digital technology. When looking at the Chief Adam Immersion School, Anishinaabe MMAK Early Immersion Program, the Ganei Geha and Mohawk Language Programs, and Mentor Apprentice Programs, all of these initiatives cultivate a strong sense of community, identity, pride, and improve the overall health and well-being of Indigenous peoples. Digital technology was also found to be an effective strategy due to its wide and instant accessibility, variety of language learning tools that each learner can choose from, and its ability to engage with the younger generation. When examining language revitalization efforts in Canada, it is evident that the Government of Canada needs to follow through with their commitment to complete all the TRC calls to action, especially the ones pertaining to supporting language revitalization efforts and funding these projects. Without funding and government support, it makes it very difficult for these language revitalization initiatives to produce enough fluent speakers to sustain the next generation of Indigenous youth. This is why there are only three immersion schools in British Columbia, according to the First Peoples Cultural Council, and why most public schools cannot offer courses that teach Indigenous languages. This is the main downfall when it comes to Canada's language revitalization efforts and why Ati Aurora is excelling. To regain lost language, the Maori in Aotearoa pushed for federally funded Maori medium schools in the 1980s leading to hundreds of Te Reo Māori immersion schools by 2022. Through this, Tamariki would be immersed in their Māori culture, finding self-identity and confidence throughout their Māori childhood and being. These school immersion schools, through early education to university, pose increasing statistics of the use of Te Reo Māori in youth across Aotearoa. Further steps include continued funding in every subject for Māori medium schools that will allow Tamariki to stay in Te Reo immersion schools and support their academic passions. We must also support the Māori by amplifying their voices, experiences, businesses, and efforts to further along decolonization in Aotearoa. To learn more about the Indigenous languages in your area, connect and develop relationships with the host nations. Speak to your local, provincial, and federal government representatives to advocate for Indigenous peoples and for the Canadian government to complete the calls to actions in regards to language revitalization and rights. Thank you for listening to Revitalization Under Colonization.